Hello, Buddhist geeks. What up? What up? It's uh, Vince and Mike here again. Yep. My name's My name's Vince and Mike, and I'm here with Mike Redmer. <laughs> I'm I'm Mike. I'm I'm the guy in the the Christmas sweater. And we're going to be doing another yeah contemplative tech. I don't know if it's quite a show as much as it is just a conversation where we're sort of just chatting about some of these topics. I guess you could call it a show in the sense that it's produced somewhat, um, but. More this is just a conversation we've been having that we wanted to start having a little bit more publicly. And, um, and we also thought it'd be cool to you know, include other people in the conversation because there's so many geeks out there that know so much about this stuff. Um, so hopefully at the, end of the, at the end of the show, we'll have some time to do some questions and comments from the um, Q&A app. Um, so feel free yeah. to sub submit, submit questions uh, while, we, while we get going. And, um, yeah, the, what we were thinking today, uh, Mike, is to start by, um, it's been a little while since we've done our last Contemplative Tech show, um, but we wanted to start with just kind of uh, sharing an update on how our Contemplative Tech experiment went. went. Um, and this was the one that Chris Dancy uh, gave us. Um, so this was the two episodes ago, so it's been a while. Um, Amber Case, we didn't have a chance to get a Contemplative Tech experiment from her. Um, and then we're going to kick it off from there going right into talking about uh, Kickstarter uh, and some of the contemplative tech uh, projects that we've been seeing there and we've been backing. Um, there's a plethora of them so we thought it'd be fun to just share what we've been learning there and um, and then we'll open it up um, to questions and answers at the end. Anything we should uh, you should uh, add there Mike? No, no I think uh, you covered everything and I'm, I'm just excited to get to the questions and answers. Yeah. Uh, to see that I, I like this app, the way it works, and uh, kind of tune it in to whoever's viewing. Uh, yeah. That'll, that'll be fun. We've already got one question, which is, where is everybody? And right. uh, the answer which, to the answer. It's a great to, question. Yeah. I don't know if he meant that in a Kensel, if you meant that in a contemplative way, but uh, I think the answer is here. We're here. Yes. What up, Kensel? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so the contemplative tech experiment, this is an idea that, you know, we, we came up with at the very beginning of the show, and we thought it would be fun to periodically um, come up with an experiment that we could do for, for the month in between the show, uh, kind of playing around with a new piece of hardware or software or something else that would fit within the broader theme of contemplative technology and to share how that experiment went. So... A couple episodes ago, Chris Dancy, our guest, we talked about quantified selflessness. He suggested uh, a couple things, but the one that uh, I ended up doing, which was to set up at least one web automation. So using tools like Zapier and Ift, these are kind of tools that let you, in some sense, program the web, where you can connect different web, uh, web services, services and software together to kind of do special things. Um, there's triggers, you know, when... You know, when I upload a file to Evernote, you know, do this. Or when, you know, when I, uh, um, for instance, when I wake up out of bed uh, and I turn my up band on, you know, turn on the coffee pot roaster downstairs, you know, and start brewing up a cup of coffee. Those are, like, types of things you can do. Um, and he suggested, yeah, setting that up. So, yeah, um, we've, I know, Mike, we've been playing with this. Kind of we took it to the extreme. I, I think I've set yeah. up maybe 40 or 50 automations, not just one. <laughs> um, yeah, so, me too. Yeah, we went a little crazy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what did you find doing this? What was it like to, to kind of create these automated web systems? And, and, and how does it fit in with the contemplative piece? That's the interesting question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> at, what, at the one level, it's just a matter of... Uh, kind of looking at all, uh, what struck me just right away after I did the experiment with Chris was um, kind of grokking really how many services I interact with on a daily basis and uh, just being amazed really at uh, all of the different services and then also uh, as Chris talks about you know all the uh, the data exhaust that I was producing every day um, so that that was pretty cool from from a contemplative perspective, just to um, you know see see what I'm laying down in terms of uh, I don't know I kind of think about it like karmic ripples, and uh, so the the energy that I'm uh, putting out in in the digital realm and how that 
kind of ripples out, and uh, I just found that really fascinating. And then it was a matter of, uh, you know, once you kind of realize all of the services you interact with, it, it, it kind of went into this design phase of um, designing how, you, you know, how to set things up that's going to uh, make your life easier or kind of take away uh, uh, activities that you need to do. So one of, one of the recipes that I set up was uh, to automatically upload any photos that I took on my iPhone um, to uh, Google Drive and Dropbox and Evernote and uh, just to have a, a backup of that. And I had been doing that manually and so it was cool just to set that up and forget about it and just know that those things are being backed up. Um, the, I did the same with you know, Instagram um, and, and that kind of thing which, which was really cool. Um, some of the other things that I set up was um, just in the morning getting a text about what the weather is going to be for that day um, to kind of take away that step of actually going and searching for the weather or, or finding out what the weather is going to be. Yeah. Um, and those are more like you know, lifestyle kind of things. Uh, I, I did experiment with, uh, I know you were a part of my, my experiments with uh, Moped and a couple of different kind of group chat services of um, basically creating a group chat room uh, around meditation and then anytime I, I tweeted um, hashtag open practice or hashtag meditation it would notify this this group this chat room right, uh, which right. would notify an app and kind of let all of my friends know that I was practicing yeah like, which um, amazing how little uh, how many how few texts I got <laughs> about that <laughs> I know well I was I was exhausted from setting it up and then uh, <laughs> I just took a nap <laughs> um, but it, I guess the, the idea that was there was like, oh, this would be really cool to, um, you know, for all my friends to be notified when I was practicing because I had been doing it um, just through text with, you know, you and a couple other people um, just letting each other know when we were practicing and kind of uh, making a commitment to, to tune in and whatever we were doing, whether we were shopping or whatever, just to like, you know, be uh, to kind of loop with the other person and say, oh, you know, uh, they're practicing, I'm going to be mindful uh, with whatever I'm doing um, while they are, too. And, and that was pretty cool because it was kind of uh, uh, an external kind of, hey, th you know, this is a time where you could choose to be mindful. And I thought it would be cool to, to set something up in a group environment where um, everybody could do that kind of communally. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it was a little, the, the, the tech on the tech side of things, it was a little bit difficult, but it was cool that you could hack something together. Yeah, um, I mean, like that. Yeah, I mean, these tools they seem to enable that kind of hacking, where you can sort of, in some sense, program some of your different services to connect. But it still seems like the impetus is largely on the end user, like the person who's doing the programming, to figure out how to use it. And there aren't, I would say, all that many. I mean, they do have scripts. You know, they do have uh, recipes, things that other users have done that are helpful, but for the most part, I was spending time just thinking about how could I use this in a kind of contemplative way, um, mm -hmm. and I came up with a couple ideas uh, with mixed success in terms of the results. Um, one was uh, sunset meditation, so I set up something where uh, when the sun was setting to text me and let me know to, to kind of, that I had an opportunity to go out and do a little sunset meditation to kind of, you know, just yeah. for a moment, for a minute or two, take in the beauty of the sun setting. And yeah. the difficulty with that one I found, I think it would have been awesome, except um, that because we were living at the time at the base of the mountains, by the time I'd get the text, um, it really would, it was already set. And, and there was no option for saying 15 minutes before the sunset or 30 minutes. Like there wasn't quite a, enough level of um, kind of uh, detail to be able to get it configured in just the right way. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought, you know, the idea itself was really good, and I think as soon as they get it to that level of detail where I could sort of set, like, okay, 30 minutes before the sun's supposed to set, then, you know, send me this text. Um, mm -hmm. That would have been really cool. And there were a couple times that it worked. I, I did catch the sun set uh, in time, and it was nice. 
Um, yeah, yeah. I I had a, a similar one in the summer, um, or when the weather was nicer and was able to go out and yeah do that. And it was cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that to me is an interesting example of using these tools for like a kind of contemplative practice. Oh, the other one that's been useful is uh, with the Jawbone Up Band. You know, this is a little activity tracker. Um, I have it set up so that when I have gotten less than like five hours sleep, to automatically email Emily, uh, my partner, and say um, basically like, "Hi, honey. I just want to warn you. I've gotten this much amount of sleep. Like, like a, a day this week earlier, I had I got like two two and a half hours of sleep that night, and so I, uh, I sort of warned her. You know, I apologize in advance for my crankiness. You know, sincerely, your sleepy husband, <laughs> Vince. <laughs> so, um, but that actually has been really helpful because you know. Um, it, it sort of notifies her, even though she kind of knew already. But it was kind of a nice reminder that, oh yeah, wait a second, like I'm I'm not operating at full peak physical performance, and to let you know let people close to me know that, so they have some context to hold the fact that I'm just not operating at you know at my normal capacity. Yeah, that that's cool. It, yeah. it I'm I'm was it uh, Douglas Rushkoff who, who who said program or be programmed? Yeah. So it, it's just so interesting with this stuff how like we're we're like programming our our lives and uh, you know kind of setting things up uh, in in such a way you know kind of bringing the the designer uh, skill set to bear here and kind of designing our lives. Yeah, yeah, and it it feels like cool. these these things like Ift and Zapier. I, I got the sense that they're enabling people without programming like specific to start to program things. I mean, it's like increasingly becoming easier to program the web and program some of these different services and connect them without necessarily needing to know like C++ or Java or JavaScript or, you know, any of these kind of programming languages that are a little more technical. Um, that, right. that was, that's pretty cool. I, I, th I found that pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so... So yeah, that was an interesting experiment. I'm, I'm going to keep doing it. I mean, I, and I would suggest, uh, you know, for the people that are that are interested in this stuff, it's it's super fascinating to kind of start playing around. So there's IFT, uh, which stands for if then if this then that, um, yeah. and that's IFT, I F T T T dot com. And then there's Zapier, which is more business focused, but they have a lot of um, they have a lot of helpful tools in there as well. Um, that's Zapier dot com. So. I would definitely check check some of those things out. Chris also suggested getting a um, what was it a, uh, a voice uh, sensor or a, a sound sensor and setting it up, but mm -hmm. I don't think either of us did that. No, no, I didn't do that. But uh, one one of the kind of accessories to um, that I've really been interested in is the the hue lights. Yeah, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> how to how to integrate that into some kind of a meditation station and yeah. I was thinking it'd be cool to set something up with a group of friends where you know the more people that are practicing if you send out a notification to come sit together then the more people that kind of join uh, it would change the the lighting so you could get kind of an, an ambient sense of like yes uh, more more people joining so there's a, yes. all, all kinds of Cool accessories too that can be plugged in, kind of Internet of Things that can yes. be plugged into this this stuff too. Yes, I mean th that's what I'm excited about. As the Internet of Things becomes more of a reality, which it, I mean it's growing uh, in, in a in a very obvious growing way. It is becoming much easier to plug into the Internet of Things. We already have devices like our smartphones that are part of that, and sensors are starting to get embedded in a lot of things. And then we've got a lot of these different kind of products popping up that tie in like the Philips Hue lights you know which are basically like Wi-Fi enabled lights that can do all kinds of different things and can connect to all these different thing programs right um, yeah I think that's gonna be exciting to see how we can use some of those ambient um, technologies to help us remember to be aware or to uh, to kind of be start tuning into what our what our close social networks are doing um, and you know one thing Chris said that blew my mind is he he has a a practice around this where he has his he has his lights set up to give him feedback based on his heart rate in real time, 
Mm-hmm. And that was an obvious example of a contemplative technology. And it's like your heart rate starts going really high, and then the lights get really bright. Your heart rate starts going low, and your and your lights start dimming. I mean, that's yeah. like an, that's an awesome uh, idea in terms of getting feedback. Now, I mean, I guess there's a question though, like how how correlative is one's heart rate with one's internal state? You know, and is it bad to have a higher heart rate? Are you trying to always have a low heart rate? I mean, there's, there's <coughs> some questions there, but I mean, the basic idea is very fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Especially, um, you know, it's really easy to get caught up in the, the story and the narrative of the day and to have that immediate uh, feedback in your actual environment of things changing to be reflective of your internal state um, of any sort, I think would be would be awesome. Yeah. So, uh, and that, and that um, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that again for one of the the Kickstarter. Yeah. I think they just reminded me about the Yeah, well the let's motive. Let's do it. Let's transition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's jump in. So um so yeah, I mean we we decided to talk about contemplative kickstarters because in the last year or so it's been obvious that some of the coolest contemplative technologies are getting kickstarted um, on Kickstarter and they're starting that way. And then recently I just I've seen a flood of these kind of projects. So um, so we wanted to kind of share some of our favorite ones, ones that we have either seen or ones that we've actually backed uh, as Kickstarter um, kind of patrons and sort of get, I mean, these are, these are all technologies that probably will be coming to market next year. So it'd be cool to you know, kind of talk about some of these. And um, Mike, do you want to you go first? Do you have a favorite kind of Kickstarter project that you've backed recently or kind of noticed? Yeah, I guess the the one that I'm really really looking forward to is the um, it's called Shadow, and it's a uh, uh, kind of a, an assist for um, uh, dream recording, and um, potentially for uh, lucid dream induction induction as well in terms of waking you up at at specific times uh, when you're in REM uh, that you'll remember your dreams. And that that's just really really interesting to me because uh, back back in the day I, I did uh, a bit of lucid dreaming hacking if you will I got I got this uh, program that uh, basically was a <clears throat> a compilation of all of the lucid dreaming books and techniques kind of distilled into uh, specific practices that you could do. <laughs> to up the chances that you have, uh, you know, a, a, a lucid dream, and uh, it worked. It actually worked, which was super cool. And um, I think the first lucid dream I had, um, I I did one of their techniques, which is, you know, I became aware in the dream, and then uh, I was like freeing all these animals, and some they were in cages, and I was letting them out, and. Um, then I started to wake up and kind of going through this this ether kind of stuff, and I remembered, uh, you know, I thought I was kind of going towards uh, something, and then it kind of dawned on me, oh, I'm waking up. And one of the recommendations was to to spin if you want to go back into the dream. Yeah, and I remember that Stephen LaBerge, right? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I remembered that amazingly enough, and started spinning, and you know, went back into the dream, and I was, it was just like a it's um, it was pretty cool, and there was like uh, I know in the 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 times that I've had lucid dreams, there's a, an immense sense of power and control, and like, um, but it, it doesn't seem like uh, it doesn't seem egotistical necessarily. It's just like almost it's a totally different experience um, to to be completely lucid and, and uh, to be flowing with. Uh, reality and and existence as as it is, um, and so any kind of aids that could help with that. I mean, one of the, yeah. the problems with the whole process was, you know, there, there was a bunch of PDFs and then a bunch of little badly produced video clips of you know how to do this, and then you needed you know a recording device to record your sleeping throughout the night, and then go back and document you know when you were snoring heavily and. Uh, what might be good times to have your alarm wake up? And one of the the best techniques was um, to 
to calculate when you would most likely be in REM and then to have some kind of a tone or an alarm that would just go off that would uh, alert you right. um, at, but then shut off so it wouldn't require you to move but it could be loud enough and they, they um, one, another Kickstarter campaign uh, the, the the Remy mask yes and it does something similar with the visual uh, field um, kind of indicating lights yeah do light to try to tell you like you're you're in REM right now you're sleeping um, and there's some issues with that approach too but I, I just love all these technologies that can help kind of bring more awareness to the dream state just because it's it's something that um, you know most people don't have access to um, you know being fully awake while dreaming so yeah yeah uh, I think I think that's totally a contemplative technology um, and something that you know the traditions have been doing for a long time but I think in, in the Western uh, version of it it's maybe not done as much yeah uh, so Anyway, Shadow is this, this app that is just really well designed and a way to record your dreams and to uh, wake you up. And they, I think they have some components, too, where they're going to um, aggregate uh, every, everyone's uh, journaling kind of uh, anonymously and um, you yes. know, use it as a research base. And I think you opt in. To something like that, but that's something else that I thought was just a really, really cool idea. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. That project. yeah, yeah, I know it's exciting. They called that, you know, like the world's first dream database. Right. And, um, my immediate thought was one, that's so cool because we could actually have some sort of collective uh, map of what people are dreaming about, and wouldn't it be interesting to connect, you know, the kinds of images and symbols and um, the types of dreams that people are having with what's actually happening in the world. You know, right. wouldn't it be interesting to see the relationship between those? And I mean, we may discover things about the human uh, kind of, I guess you could call it unconscious, or um, or Jung would call it the unconscious, um, but, but the human mind as it's sort of processing when we're not awake and seeing the way that that's connected to things that are actually happening in the world. Um, that'd be fascinating. And then two, I thought about, you know, how cool would that be for meditation as well? You know, for, if there were, were a way for people to record even just basic types of experiences that they were noticing in meditation and have a, a worldwide database of, of meditative experience. Um, yeah, Espe especially as it relates to location and kind of space-time, you know. That, I, I just think that's going to be so cool. I've read so many studies about, uh, um, you know, there being some kind of correlation between kind of... Uh, very moment, uh, kind of catastrophic dreams that, that are happening where people have, you know, we've all had these dreams of just like, you know, kind of apocalyptic type right. dreams. And then, you know, something kind of catastrophic uh, happening very close to that, like uh, uh, the, the, the events at the World Trade Center, you know, right. uh, one of those situations. And then how that plays out locationally, if there's any you know, ripple or or if it happens simultaneously. I mean, that's right. That would be fascinating. Yeah, I mean, that could that could reveal. I mean, if you had enough data points, I imagine that could reveal something about the nature of the collective human minds. And if there was any sense of, you know, a clear correlation between you know what's happening in people's dreams prior to an event. I mean, yeah, stuff like that could completely change how we look at the mind and how we look at um, the collective. Um, yeah, that would be fascinating, and I'm curious, yeah, what'll come of stuff like that. Um, back to what you said about lucid dreaming. Um, that's something I've I've practiced with a little too, and um, especially when I first started meditating, <coughs> because it just seems so cool to be able to control the dream, uh, yeah. the dream state. And it is amazing. I mean, for people that have had lucid dreams, I mean, it's immediately one of those kind of experiences that like ranks up there, you know, in the top. You know, it's like in the top ten experiences of your lifetime in terms of just being amazing. Um, right. To, to be awake and aware in a dream, it's uh, unlike um, it's unlike anything else in a certain way. Yeah. And uh, Alan Wallace, you know, who I like a lot, he he teaches lucid dreaming both in the Western tradition uh, and also in the Tibetan dream yoga tradition. And he he kind of described lucid dreaming as uh, um, kind of kind of like uh, Lab, uh, treating your dreams like a laboratory for the mind, 
because mm. once you're awake in the dream, you have a certain amount of, you do have a certain amount of control or flexibility, and it's like you're dealing with this whole universe that doesn't um, conform to the normal laws of the physical universe. So you can mm -hmm. do all kinds of experiments there in this sort of pure mind space um, where right. it's constrained by physical uh, conditions. And they can be meditative experiments, they can be you know, all kinds of consciousness experiments, and um, that's fascinating to be able mm. to do that. And I wonder if these technologies will increasingly um, enable the ability to get to the lucid state faster. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wonder what that will do. Because this is the interesting thing about contemplative technologies. You know, they, they, they seem to all be about speeding up some sort of process, but then mm -hmm. because they can speed it up, you know, you get a little flash of light um, to wake you up in the dream, or one, one uh, lucid dreaming um, uh, inducing technology that was also in Kickstarter that I backed uh, it was called Lucy, and it uses uh, earphones, like uh, sleep earphones, and it kind of sends you a... And also it has an EEG thing in the back of the back of this band, and so it's actually looking for the physical signs of REM sleep, you know, in terms of your EEG patterns. And then uh, when, when, it, when you're in REM, it sort of does an auditory signal, which I guess has maybe a little bit of benefit over the visual because the visual is a little... It's like a little easier to incorporate into the dream state. Right. Um, but it basically tells you you're in a dream, you know, take control. Um, and if, if that really works in terms of increasing the uh, percentage, you know, chant likelihood that you're going to wake up, you know, it's like training wheels for the mind uh, in yeah. terms of lucid dreaming, then what's going to happen to all, I mean, because a lot of the dream yoga practices, right, of Tibet, there a lot of them are about being able to get to the point where you can be lucid in the dream. Mm -hmm. So it's like there's all kinds of practices around, you know, um, when, as you're, you know, going around your day, reminding yourself that this is like a dream and checking in to see if you're dreaming. That's in the lucid dreaming, you know, technique. And then, you know, with dream yoga, you're also doing a lot of shamatha practice as a, as, mm -hmm. a, as a prerequisite for becoming lucid. So there's a sort of quality of training your attention so that your attention <clears throat> can be fluid enough to wake up in the dream. Now, if right. these hardware devices, right, like they enable us to just wake up in the dream, like, you know, you know much, uh, much more quickly without that sort of pre-training, you know, does that take something away? Um, from these amazing, you know, dream traditions. I mean, it clearly takes something away, um, you know. And what's lost uh, is is kind of one question I have with all these contemplative technologies. Something's gained and something's lost. Yeah. So, so what is? Well, <coughs> I know <coughs> it's really interesting because um, the uh, the traditions, you know, they're they've kind of been hacking it without any tech, you know, exterior kind of. Right. hardware apparatus or, the, you know, understanding of, like, kind of Western science about what dreams are and what might be more effective and it, it, that kind of thing. Like, they've been kind of just experimenting tr trial and error and come up with some really powerful techniques that have been working for a long time. And um, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, similar to, to working out, you know, where now we have all these biohacking techniques uh, technologies and we know how the body works and so we don't have to work as hard you know we, we can modify our diet in a particular way to, to lose weight really quickly and to gain muscle really quickly by doing just really minimal things where a couple of years prior you know you had to do all kinds of strenuous stuff and um, you know nutritional regimens and all this kind of thing and we're kind of just getting more efficient at getting the results that we want and you know, it's possible that the same thing could happen, but I think the the danger is that you know you you lose a, a richness around um, why why do you want to become conscious in the dream? You know, a lot of people want to do that because you know they can do psychological work in terms of um, dealing with uh, fears and mm -hmm. um, you, you know issues like that. While there's also the motivation for others, you know, if they have uh, a terminal illness or something like that and really wanting to confront, uh, the, you know, uh, their own uh, consciousness and, the, and this, this strange, uh, you know, existent, you know, be existing in and whatever, whatever yeah. that means, like how bizarre that is. 
and a lot of these ancient traditions, you know, have the, the whole uh, or a lot of the goal of it is so that you can die uh, consciously, you know, and you can just wakefully uh, expire, you know, through through this this uh, existence and transition, um, which I I think is uh, really really awesome. And it, you know, the other question that comes to mind is. Uh, that I've always thought about is is you know this people talking about uploading consciousness and you know like the transhumanist dream you know to upload yeah consciousness yeah and like into the cloud or something yeah and how how would you go about doing that and is it even possible and all of this science that's coming out for uh, near death experiences where the body is completely dead heart the brain everything um, that, so there shouldn't it shouldn't be alive and yet there's a there's some consciousness that's surviving it and then coming back you know long after science said it, it should and so there, there's there's something there where the ancient tr traditions are have been talking about and have known about it for some strange amazing reason you know I've watched some documentary Tibetan you know about the Tibetan Book of the Dead and kind of their their practices and and you know um, the, what ha what happens in, in from that perspective um, through death and it's just fascinating and it, it kind of correlates with this, these weird uh, uh, scientific documentations of, of people dying you know their body actually dying and then having a sense of uh, awareness uh, beyond that and so you know marrying that with some of these technologies to become more awake in the dream and maybe transition and you know, maybe maybe there is some some way to upload, uh, you know, some awareness or consciousness. I don't know. It's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating question, and I see why you brought that up since dreams already are kind of what you might imagine to be like an uploaded consciousness into, you know. Right. I mean, some people say like this is a simulation anyway. So right. you got Nick Nick Borstrom, <coughs> the the mm -hmm. uh, futurist who. He wrote a really awesome article on that, actually, about how it's quite likely that we're in a simulation of some sort. But um, right. going back to what you're saying, too, I mean, with lucid dreaming, you talked about some of the ways once you're lucid, you can you can use the lucid state. You can harness it. You know, you can harness it for contemplative means. You can harness it for psychological means. But then you can also harness it, you know, just to, like, uh, play out fantasies, um, like yeah. have, you know, simulated sex with whoever you want or... Uh -huh. um, you know, you can also use it to try to perfect, you know, certain kind of techniques. You could use it, you know, to do to perfect unethical skills or skills that you'd use in the service of being completely unethical. Um, you right, know, right. And you could so, be Hitler in your dreams. I mean, you could do anything. <laughs> I mean, that's part of the that's part of the promise and and also part of the weirdness of the lucid state is like it's so fluid and flexible. So, so my yeah. question is these. You know these hardwares. They they seem to be coming out. You know th this contemplative technology is not contemplative by nature. You know just becoming lucid itself is not contemplative per se. I mean it's it's how in my experience is how you use that lucid state and what the intention is um, that sort of informs uh, whether or not it's actually used as a contemplative technology. Um, and, and that's fascinating as well. You know to think that. Um, we can use things that have the potential to be very supportive for contemplative awareness in service mm -hmm. of other kinds of awareness that are, you know, quite tangential, you know, in a certain way, uh, right. or maybe like even completely at odds with with the kinds of things that we're talking about. So yeah, it seems like that dictum of you know the, how how the technologies used, the intention um, seems to still hold true even when we start getting into stuff like this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see that happening, you know, just with, just with the actual hardware technology, you know, iPhones. You know how there's there's a lot of cool apps that really aid meditation and mindfulness and uh, contemplation. And there's also a lot of other apps that, uh, like that Hatch app that I was talking, my little my little Tamagotchi, you know, <laughs> which uh, you know isn't contemplative at all. Um, so th there's always that that uh, yes. possibility, um, which which you know it's 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 fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating, and it I think it's yeah. I, I we could we could go on about that, but I well, I one, know what one other thing I wanted to kind of bring up was um, 
you know, around this question of what's what's gained and what's lost um, with a new technology. I was talking with uh, speaking with Ken McLeod recently about this on Skype. We were having just a chat, and you know, he pointed out that um, mastery, the sense of mastery, is something that uh, requires one to do something over and over again, and we're sort of in the situation where technologies are not just disrupting, you know, music industries or film or whatever, but they're also disrupting all of these ancient contemplative traditions potentially. Like, they're, mm -hmm. if we come up with a way to, you know, develop lucid dreaming without needing to do all these pre-lucid dreaming techniques and stuff, like that's disrupting the entire like dream yoga, like at least a part of the dream yoga traditions. And yeah. the question that 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 he sort of had is, can we really develop a sense of mastery, not for something else, not focusing on getting some sort of result, which is more of a utilitarian approach, but rather mastery in doing something for its own sake, you know, doing mm -hmm. something simply to do it, and, mm -hmm. and in some sense looking at our practice um, at, uh, from that point of view, and, and, it, and if, if that is uh, a mature way of practicing, you know, where there's a certain way in which the results have been let, uh, we've let go of a, a particular notion of what we should be experiencing, and we're not we're not doing it for the result, we're doing it for itself. Can we develop mastery with with things changing so quickly and so many different kinds of practices being disrupted? I think that was an interesting question. Yeah, I I mean, I I think it's an interesting question even outside of the contemplative practices. Yeah, I mean, I I see the this the same thing happening where uh it you know I remember when I was a kid you know and I wanted to learn you know I learned guitar I taught myself how to play guitar and there was hours and hours and hours of you know listening to you know four bars of Led Zeppelin and, and then rewinding it and then, uh, you know, listening to it again and then trying to figure it out and doing that again. And, you know, nowadays um, it just seems like technology is making information and things that you need uh, so much, so accessible that it it's almost not even necessary a lot of times. Like things that you would need to master yes. before... Uh, aren't necess it doesn't necessarily play out the same way where you don't really need to master it you can accomplish the same end result um, you know and skip half the steps and not be a master but just get get the information you need in order to achieve the results yeah you look like a master from the outside but you may not have right. the inner experience of being a master yeah yeah so it it's uh, I definitely think there's there's something there's something lost there and it's almost like uh, I have these um, kind of reflective thoughts about those days you know when it you know I'm just pouring hours and hours and hours to a particular activity and um, you know just for the the joy of it and you know seeing a progression and yes. um, you know I think meditation is still one of those things that requires yes. that amount of, of dedication right and right. after you know, effort and mastery, um, and it's something that you don't get the 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 quick benefits right away necessarily. You know. Yeah, or, or maybe like you do a little bit in the beginning, but then it you know it plateaus fairly quickly, and you you're not. Yeah, yeah, you gotta you gotta work through that. It's like you every every level achieved, so to speak, is something that you know you uh, you gotta you gotta work for. Yeah. Um, it doesn't. It's you can't call up on the online matrix and say, you know, give, give me, you know, X amount of uh, attentional power and just, you know, it happens. It's like you got you to work that and cultivate that, yeah. that particular muscle. So. Okay, this, this is a good segue, I think, to the, to the next <clears throat> contemplative Kickstarter uh, okay. projects that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to try screen sharing. I've never done this before. We'll screen share and see if this works in the Hangout on Air. Everyone's watching, Vince. Everyone's watching oh. your screen. So, um, so I wanted to share this other. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay, so this is the Lucy. Um, I'm sorry, no, uh, we already talked about this. Um, this is the emotive insight. So this is uh, speaking of being able to call up meditative states, you know, quickly. 
um, there's this whole kind of movement of obviously of EEG uh, headsets um, that are becoming very rapidly better. So this is one of the biggest companies based in San Francisco at Motive, and they have their Insight, which is a six-channel EEG headset that looks kind of, I was thinking it looks kind of like uh, what would happen if an alien sort of latched onto your head and uh, started sucking your brains out. But, I mean, this is a, in terms of the hardware, like, this thing is way leagues above um, what we had even a few years ago. It's got six... It's got a six-axis sensor, so it's got six different sensors. So it's improving the the spatial, you know, quality of the EEG, picking up, you know, signals from different areas. Um, it's got a, a magnet a magnetometer. Um, so, uh, to be honest, I have no clue. I don't, what I don't know what that is. But it sounds <laughs> awesome. Hey, d- hey, dude, uh, scroll up to the the view of the of the in because I want to show a, a an older model. This is something that. Uh, Vince and I went in on together uh, a couple of years ago, um, <clears throat> and this thing is, an un- is so uncomfortable. Um, but this is an older model, and this this seems to be way way better designed. And um, this only has one one channel here. This one's got a lot more. So yeah, that's that's a one channel headset that we played with, and you know it's really interesting. Um... Even playing with that one, though, that was $100, what, like five years ago? Yeah. And even playing with that, I, I did see a connection between the internal state and the um, and, and the external representation of the software. I mean, there was some connection. It wasn't great, and it definitely wasn't good enough that I would use it as a kind of training tool. But I'm curious, you know, as these things get better and as people start working on software, um, you know, that, that may have a better chance at, at kind of seeing seeing the EEG patterns in terms of what their actual internal states are like, you know, are we going to start seeing the ability to use these tools as neurofeedback, like legitimate neurofeedback to be able to cultivate certain states of consciousness more quickly? Um, And if so, again, that brings us into this question, how is that going to change the the process of mastery? I think it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. And and you were talking about, with this uh, headset, we were talking earlier, they... um, they're using it for drivers to kind of indicate distracted driving, um, where when you become distracted, it uh, causes the car to decelerate. Um, so you, if you're if you're not focused and totally in you know the driving zone, uh, then the car is going to not go anywhere, which is really interesting, um, especially how that could relate to um, you know sometimes when my wife's talking to me in a kind of spacing out if she's going to want to hook up a shot collar or something. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. I mean, I mean, and then then the question becomes, well, you know, say you're working for a company and they require you to wear a headset so that they can make sure that your attention isn't wandering. So, I mean, that's very different than if you're choosing to, to, to train your own attention and you're doing it because you want to be focused. You know, what happens when someone else is telling you you have to be focused? And you know how does that change the experience of some of these these devices and tools? Because I imagine that changes it uh, probably a lot. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So so hopefully we'll see. I mean, we'll see some of these technologies kind of come out. And we'll be able to play with them in the next um, several months. So I think that'll be fun to. Yeah, I'm looking forward to trying my little alien headset out, seeing oh. seeing how good the how good it works. Yeah, yeah, and you got the black one, which which I I like. I like that. I I think that'll look good. Match your uh, your, yeah. your your uniform. You know? Yeah, your, exactly. Your, your black patties. It's, it, it'll it'll look good in the zen though. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Very zen. Um, cool. Well, that was fun. Just sort of chatting about some of the different you know Kickstarter technologies that are coming out, and um, I find it interesting that Kickstarter is. You know, just like SoundCloud has been for kind of avant-garde music lately, Kickstarter's kind of like that for avant-garde contemplative technologies. There, mm-hmm. there are a lot of amazing ones that come out through that channel. So, um, yeah, it's really, really need to see that. Yeah, okay. totally. You want to, you want to go into questions? Yeah, I think we should do that. Um, yeah, we've got a couple popping up already. I know. I um, for the questions, I thought it would be cool if. Um, 
you know, any any kind of questions that the, the audience has, or maybe suggestions for uh, future contemplative tech episodes, uh, maybe topics uh, you're interested in uh, that you'd like to see Vince and I explore, um, guests that you'd like to see us uh, interview that might might be interesting and kind of um, fall under this category of contemplative technology. Yeah, uh, yeah. and, and that would be cool. And general comments too are, are great as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Absolutely. They don't have to be framed as a question, obviously. Yeah. Um, cool. Let's go with John. Uh, John Simons, and, and and also you can vote. You know, you can plus one questions or comments that you like. So. Um, oh yeah, that's cool. That as well. Uh, so John, uh, I think he, I would reframe this kind of as a statement, but um, uh, the question he poses: Will our definition of mastery change to include new, new technologies in the spaces they create? Um, I think if you reframe that as a statement, you know. Uh, mastery will change to include new technologies in the spaces cr they create. Uh, that's the part we didn't really talk about. Uh, I wanted to bring up the kind of contrarian view, which is like, what are we losing? But yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. When I was talking to Ken, that was the argument that I made, that, well, in fact, you know, um, we're developing kind of this capacity uh, of mastery, which is the, the mastery of mastering new things. You know, there, there's, some, there's some quality in which we're becoming good at becoming good at things, and that is itself could be itself a kind of mastery. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yes, they they do seem <clears> to open up new spaces. Like as as soon as you know you can lose a dream more easily, then you can skip to the part of the practices and really get really good at the lucid dreaming part. You know, um, and and maybe you're not as good as at, at the at the stages leading up to that because you're using hardware to induce it. But then maybe you can get really good. At doing practices within the lucid dream because you have the ability to enter them more regularly, um, and that certainly wouldn't that open up um, something new? Uh, it seems like it would to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I think especially nowadays with <clears throat> I see this uh, playing out in comparison to my parents, let's say, who maybe don't don't know uh, anything about a certain topic, and within five minutes, you know, I can pretty almost, you know, be an expert on the, on the topic, you know, or pretty close just from quick web searches and knowing where to look and where to uh, pull information from. And so there's, there's uh, you know, there's something maybe lost in terms of uh, actually pouring over Encyclopedia Britannica's and uh, turning <laughs> physical pages and, and that kind of thing, but um, th there's something gained definitely just in terms of uh, the skill to grab and access information really really quickly and apply you know apply that to accomplish certain goals so mm. interesting um, yeah John I don't think we're really doing your question any real justice because it's such nope. a big one but uh, yeah. I think I, I like that and maybe, maybe we can have you on contemplative tech and talk about it sometime oh yeah that'd be nice yeah um, so another kind of statement here uh, from Patrick, uh, from Patrick Trelor. Um He said, I agree, but you know what? I'm starting playing the guitar again, and the one thing I feel I got wrong, and the main thing these quick fixer guitar methods miss, is something that comes from my meditation practice, and that is to listen to the space between the notes. And he said, it's transforming my practice, uh, both musical and meditative. No one teaches that, but it's so important. And I think a master, in quotes, musical and meditative would probably agree. Um, so, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I I I really love that. I mean, not uh, obviously. Maybe some people know that um, you know I created this app Rewire based on Shinzen's techniques, which are, um, you know it, the technique is to listen to the gongs or the vanishings or the space between, and I think that um, those those spaces and just kind of thinking back to when I did learn guitar, um, how those experiences were very meditative in terms of uh, just being completely absorbed and immersed in uh, experience. And yes. uh, the, the space between as being the, 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 the context of the content and seeing the relationship between the two. And... Um, you know that that's how that's what music is is you know music is um, what the notes are as much as it is what the notes aren't 
and so you have this this mutually dependent experience and yes. um, once you you know as a musician once you start to uh, learn this stuff and, and approach it from a you know what what is music and how how do I make music and melody and rhythm and uh, seeing how these things fit together it it can be a, a really contemplative experience mm -hmm. um, and so yeah I completely agree Patrick uh, yeah that's 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 a good good insight yeah I mean it seems like there's a parallel in the in the instructions that I've received on sh on uh, um, concentration meditation with the breath where you know, it's not just about noticing the sensations of the breath as it comes in or leaves, but it's also about noticing the gap between the in-breath and out-breath and being able to kind of rest in the gap. And I, I find that really interesting, not just because it helps kind of stay with the breathing process, but also because, um, you know, what happens when I've noticed the gap is oftentimes it's in the gap that things arise. Um, you know, the, one that the mind wanders, but then also that interesting insights arise. You know, at the bottom of the in-breath, for instance, so many of the classical meditative uh, experiences that, that I've had happen at the, at the bottom of an in-breath or, you know, a, 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 in a period where there is a gap. And then there's also this kind of fascinating piece around, yeah, what you're talking about, like kind of the negative space. Um, of experience where it's like if we're too focused on the content and on the on the on the sensory experience we miss like the constant ground that 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 experience seems to be arising within or, or and that's simply like a metaphor because um, it's not even at, at kind of the most fundamental level it's not even a space it's it's just the um, I, and this is where words start breaking down really rapidly in my experience, but you know, there, yeah. there's some fundamental quality to experience that isn't bound up in the experience, and that that space or that gap or that negative space seems to be at least initially a, a metaphor for that, like a pointer to that in a relative sense. But then in the absolute sense, it it, it it's happening all the time, and it's it's complete. All experience is that. There's no separation yeah. between experience and that and that gap or the or the silence or the med or the negative space like it it's all kind of negative space uh, you know at once um, well I, I i i've kind of put together two metaphors from from shinzen and ken wilber and i i like to think about it like um like a grid in terms of uh geometry and thinking about uh a grid is you know, you have coordinates in terms of events, and you can kind of think of that of, as sensory experiences. And you know, the the intersection of the grid typically we're taught is zero, uh, but that's not actually zero because you can you can zoom in infinitely, and it still has space. So to borrow from Ken Wilber, it's it's more, zero is more like the the page on which the graph would be written. In terms of infinite potential for this, these events to occur, and there's a relationship between the two because you can't have one without the other, and they're 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 mutually dependent on each other, and so the way that zero permeates um, uh, every everything, you know, and 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 the converse as well, how they have a, a mutually dependent uh, relationship and kind of co co arise. Um, and you know the the, sp the space is uh, this kind of cleft, you know, between uh, birth and death um, that that happens. And I, it's it's just amazing to me, like as a as a contemplative and seeing these kind of uh, uh, con contemplative metaphors and ways in which you know teachers talk about uh, the meditative experience and reality and you know having done the injunctions and produced the results and then seeing how really any of these approaches like we're talking about music um, as one approach um, but you know philosophy or mathematics or anything else like can can they, they all kind of overlap and, and point to to similar things in my opinion anyway mm. um.
just kind of being aware of the time. We've only got a few yeah, minutes yeah. left, and I, I actually um, need to bounce at the end of the hour. Um, there's a few more great questions that came in, and unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to get to them. Um, oh, John asked about the uh, nutritional supplements. Um, <laughs> John, I'm rocking it right now. I got oh, it coursing great. through my veins, some, some alpha brain. Um, so if you're, if you're interested, definitely check that out. Uh, yeah. Three capsules. Three capsules a day. Keep, yeah, keep, I just keep it, the it, wandering it, thoughts away. Yeah, it's got like maybe a like a four hour effective, you know, and then kind of trails off. Um, so I would do three capsules either like seven uh, seven to eight o'clock at night if you want to increase chances for lucid dreaming. Um, that that works really well. And then um, right before some kind of uh, uh, cognitive and you know cognitively intense. Uh, situation. <laughs> yeah. I'd recommend that. I think I need some of those. Um, and then maybe we could just get to this one super quick from Rob. Um, yep. Rob mentioned that uh, TDCS, uh, um, like the focus a headband. I'm curious to hear other contemplative thoughts, experiences on this, or any other form of direct modulation technologies. Um, I haven't used uh, any of the transcranial direct stimulation stuff yet, but um, I know Shinzen Young uh, speaks really highly of it. And I'm I'm curious to try it. The only thing I've wondered about with the Focus is it's designed and kind of built around kind of uh, helping with gaming. So I wasn't sure how much uh, relevance that was going to have for contemplative practice. I mean, it, it probably has some relevance because it's focused on Focus. But um, I'm curious, you know, because in my experience there are lots of different kinds of Focus, and so uh, I'm I'm not quite sure how relevant that is going to be to at least the way the focus headband is set up to kind of my meditative kind of practices. But um, I'm, I'm very curious to try that stuff. I think it, it seems yeah. like conceptually it has a lot of promise um, based on the little bit that I've heard. But, um, and the fact that there are now devices coming out that, um, that you can buy without having to kind of hack them together is pretty exciting. Yeah, I'm super interested to, to try that out because there there is a certain level of um, especially with with meditation there's a there's a, 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 a skill involved in uh, just for example making distinctions between uh, sensory categories um, and really feeling into that space and if you can have higher um, attentional focus and intent. It seems it seems like that may affect you know a, a a speed to be able to to do that or pick up that skill set or um, train that particular skill set. So it it's interesting, worth worth experimenting with. I think. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll be able to to pull together some bones and go in on a focus uh, headband and kind of <laughs> yeah, with that that could be a good contemplative experiment. Sometime. Totally. Yeah. All right. Agree. Well, um, thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks for the questions. Sorry we didn't have time to, to get to all of them. Um, and uh, thanks for listening to us uh, drone on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Very, very patient. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. All right, so we'll be back on next month. And uh, I think next month we're going to have, uh, we're going to invite Mikey Siegel to join us. Who's uh, uh, He worked on the BrainBot project, uh, and he's also done a couple other contemplative tech projects. A nice, nice guy. And, um, extremely geeky when it comes to this area. So hopefully we'll have him on to join us next month. Yeah, that'll be exciting. Yeah. All yeah. right, bye everybody. Have a good uh, right. holiday. Enjoy your Thanksgiving and uh, don't overclock your brain too hard. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>